All right, so we are on our last kingdom, Animal Kingdom. So we'll talk about, like I said, in sort of two groups, invertebrates starting today, then vertebrates uh, after we finish that. And we're going to talk about the classification, the taxonomy of both types of animals. They're all animals. Um, we'll talk about some of the different phyla, some of the different classes, and even orders as we, as we move forward. Okay. So we're talking about animals, and it, when we talk about animals, we're talking about anything from a sponge to um, an elephant. Okay. And so um, there's a large variety of different types of organisms that are members of this kingdom. So as you guys told me in our question of the day, animals are multicellular eukaryotic heterotrophs. And throughout evolution, animals have evolved a variety of different body plans, levels of complexity, adaptations, and so forth. We kind of can split animals into two large groups. Okay? The animals with a backbone and a spinal cord, okay? which we call vertebrates, and the animals without a backbone, without a spinal cord. We call them invertebrates. So we're starting by talking about invertebrates. Invertebrates were the first animals to evolve. <clears throat> a little quiz here. Vertebrate or invertebrate? symmetry in math class before, right? Mm -hmm. Symmetry of different shapes. What is, um, so asymmetry, when you put the prefix a before a word, you know what it does to the word? It yeah, it kind of makes it not, or the opposite. So if an organism has asymmetry, what does that mean? It's not, it's not symmetrical. There is no overall pattern to how its body is laid out. This shape is, has asymmetry. I can't draw a line dividing this into equal parts at all. What type of symmetry would um, an oak tree have? Asymmetry. Asymmetry, yeah. There's no overall pattern. All right. Bilateral symmetry. Bi means two. Lateral means sides. 
So bilateral symmetry is when an organism, a, a group, is laid out. So you have basically two equal halves. The body is laid out with equal parts on each side. So what is it? I don't know. So the body you can't split it? Yes. Symmetry? Yes. Yeah. So here we have an example. That's bilateral symmetry. What two equal sides. Wait, why does he have a mustache? I don't know. It's like that. Yeah. I was no shave in November for but no shape, only your upper Okay, a human has bilateral symmetry. In fact, all of the vertebrates have bilateral symmetry. You draw a line right down the middle of your body. The overall layout of your body is an arm on each side, an eye on each side, an ear on each side, and two legs. Now, it doesn't have to be perfect, okay? There always is some variation. Okay? It's just sort of the overall layout of that type of organism, okay, is on this pattern. Then there's radial symmetry. What do you think that means, Richard? Circular symmetry. Circular symmetry, radius of a circle. Circular symmetry in which things are arranged sort of like spokes on a wheel or in a circular pattern. And with circular symmetry, usually, you can draw several lines dividing it in equal parts. Here's some examples. What is this one called? Bilateral symmetry. Okay. How about this one? Radial. Okay, again, if you imagine looking at this sea anemone from the top, those tentacles are radiating out from a central area, kind of like spokes on a tire. That's radial symmetry. In the sponge, it's asymmetry. Was that the sponge? You thought that was like a coral. Maybe it's like a coral. Could be either one. Coral. All right. <laughs> Real quickly, because we're sort of getting over high though. The cat? Bi bilateral. You could write, you could just write letters. How about the spider? Bi I heard controversy. All of them. All of them. Just one. Who's confident in their answer? Yes. Dan? Yes. Not radial. We can't. It has like, you know, a little picture on each side, half of the atom. We couldn't draw a line this way. It wouldn't be equal halves. We can only draw a single line up and down, splitting in equal parts. That's bilateral symmetry. How about this amoeba? Asymmetry. Asymmetry. How about a, a, um, a sea urchin like this? Uh, Jeremy or Christopher? Jeremy. Radio symmetry. Correct. Those spikes are oriented in a circular pattern. This planaria? Bilateral. We'll look at them. I ordered them today. They should be here. It looks like a How about this horseshoe crab? Bilateral. Bilateral. How about a sand dollar? Radial. Radial, right? Radiating out from a central point. How about a starfish? It's not zero. It's radial. Yeah, and those arms come out from a central point. Now we could draw a line like this, and we would have equal halves. Or I could draw a line like this, equal halves. Or a line like this, equal halves. Multiple lines of symmetry. All right, so let's talk about the invertebrates. Invertebrate animals, animals without a spinal cord, animals without a backbone. Now, if I had asked you, if I say think of an animal, picture one. Chances are almost all of you are thinking about a vertebrate, right? When you think of animals, you probably think of it a vertebrate. However, 95% of all animals are invertebrates. So vertebrates are a small percentage of the overall number of identified species. And they go from very simple organisms that you might not even realize as an animal, something like a sponge. Why are those animals? We'll talk about it. Two things that are quite complex, okay, a crab or an octopus or things like that. So how is this one simple and then the crab Yes. All right, so let's start. We're going to start from simplest animals and, and sort of build to more complex. So the first group, they all have Latin names, and sometimes we use the Latin names, sometimes we use just. Um, a common name. So when I say sponge, that's kind of like the common name. Well, 
So let's talk about our classification. What domain are we in now? Animals. No. Invertebrates. No. Eukarya. Eukarya. What kingdom are we in? Animals. Animal. What we're going to do is talk about several phyla of invertebrates. Okay? So periphera is a phylum. Okay? It's the sponges. Okay? And so periphera, so we, the notes may change a bit. You might just have to add some things in. Have asymmetry. This is a sponge. So this sponge has no symmetry. It's asymmetrical. And this is an, ex this is an animal, was an animal. This is the remains of it. So these natural sponges you might have on your home. You can buy them like, you know, the fancy bath store or something. Um, you might have one, if you have a pet current crab, you might have a little natural sponge in there. Artists sometimes use it. But this is basically the skeleton of an animal that was once alive. The living parts are dead, and this is what's left. Okay? And it's called periphera, like pores. A pore is holes. Many little tiny holes. These attach themselves to the floor of uh, the ocean, and they are what we call filter feeders. What that means is they suck water in through all these little holes in their body, and then they, have, they filter out tiny bits of plankton or bacteria or protists, and that's what they consume for energy. And then they squeeze out the excess water. Okay. So they come in a huge variety of shapes, sizes, colors, um, but they're animals. They're multicellular. They're heterotrophs. Okay, and they are eukaryotes. So they have all of the characteristics of animals. Here are some examples of different types of sponges. Oh, sorry. None of them look like sponges. Wait, I have a question. Yes. If they're stuck, how do they reproduce? Um, they can. They reproduce by sending out sperm cells and egg cells, which fertilize, and then disperse the so like flowers, like Similar, yeah, kind of like a flower. So what's the, what's the sponge that you use that's like... That's just a piece of foam. It's an artificial, a synthetic sponge. Oh. It's not an actual sponge. These kind, you know, are actual sponges. And they're very simple. They don't have any body systems. They don't have um, complex um, nervous systems. They're basically a collection of cells that um, allow them to stay alive, reproduce, and do their thing. How long do they get from? I don't know. With the lifespan of the sponge, it's pretty long. Do people eat fish? I mean, no. And fish eat. I don't believe, not that I know of. There's not a whole lot of like living material inside there that would be very nutritious. <clears throat> All right, the next group are called the nidarians. That's the phylum. These are the um, jellyfish and similar types of animals. So includes jellyfish, also corals, hydra, which we'll look at, sea anemones. These are all nidarians. Nidarians have radial symmetry. And they have special cells that are stinging cells called nematocysts. There are these little cells on their tentacles that basically can shoot out like a little harpoon that enters the body of their prey and immobilizes them so that the nidarian can then consume them. But we'll look at this one. This is hydra, small um, invertebrate. You can see the tentacles on the top. It has one body opening where food enters. So the, the hydra or the jellyfish, they immobilize, sting, kill their prey, take it with their tentacles. They put it into their body. They have just one opening here. It gets digested, and then any waste comes out that same opening. Oh. Okay. So they only have one <laughs> body opening for uh, consuming food. Are man rays also <clears throat> No. So here we have a sea anemone. So a sea anemone is another nadarian. Sea anemones have tentacles with stinging cells. However, they also have this symbiotic relationship with the clownfish, where the clownfish is um, unaffected by these nematocysts. And it's one of the few fish that can go into the tentacles without being stung. And so 
that's helpful to the clownfish because it gives them a safe place sort of to hide from any predators. At the same time, they bring in little bits of food into their home inside the anemone. The anemone can consume some of that food. So they both benefit out of that relationship. Why is the clownfish not a uh, Just out of, because of, I think, um, a layer of mucus or something on their, on their scales yeah. that prevents them from being infected. These are more anemones. They have you know, bright color. They can step to a, a surface, okay, grab little bits of food, put it into their body. Jellyfish, okay. Um, and, you know, it's depending on the type of jellyfish, some can sting humans. Have you ever been, um, you know, I've never gotten the on the ocean and uh, they float around? Some of them have long tentacles. And if you get touched by one of these long tentacles, uh, they can shoot those nematocysts into you. Uh, it can hurt and burn. Um, there are some types of jellyfish, like the box jellyfish, that are, can be um, deadly to humans. Um, <coughs> um, they're, they're, they're pretty, uh, there's not a whole lot of them. Um, I thought they were in sort of the equatorial, like, Atlantic, but I'm not positive. Um, can jellyfish just stay in the no, once they're dead, they, they can't. A lot of times you see them, they wash up on the beach, yeah, you know? Yeah. Depends how long they've probably been dead for. It's what they do. Yeah, or you could pick them up, like my, like you pick up like in, so when we go to South Carolina, you see like the bullseye jellyfish wash up, and a lot of times you could pick them up and they're not gonna sting you. What are the purple ones? So the, the bluish yeah. purple ones, yeah. with like a bubble? Yeah. They're uh, called the Portuguese man of war. Yeah, oh, yeah. Those those like really, yeah they, they uh, float that little you bubble floats on the top of the water and they are like a little sailboat sort of that helps yeah, propel them through the water. Yeah. Um, and now a little tip for you. If you do get stung by a jellyfish, you know what the people generally say Don't the, the, the remedy is? is the tail? Yeah. 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 <laughs> it's actually um not helpful to pee on. When do you see some of just get out of the water and they start peeing on their arms? Yeah, uh, actually, so if you're someplace where jellyfish are commonly sting people and there's like a lifeguard station, usually what they'll have there is a little spray bottle with vinegar. And what you're supposed to do to get stung is take like something to scrape the nematocyst out of your skin. Because it hurts and burns for a long time because those nematocysts go into your skin and stay there. So like sometimes they say like a credit card or something like that to scrape the nematocysts out and get them off your skin and then spraying them with like a mild acid, like a vinegar, will help to neutralize the compounds that cause the burning. So that's what they'll generally do for you. Um, some jellyfish are bioluminescent. They produce their own light. Okay. So they can form these patterns, kind of interesting. Is that how they get like when they use stuff for no. Yeah. yeah, that's not this. The nematocysts are in the tentacles, so not in the jelly part of the medusa. All right. Um, if chinoderms. So chinoderms are, the name means spiny skin. The chinoderms have radio symmetry. They include some things you probably also see at the ocean. Um, and they also have one body opening for food and waste to go into and out of. Um, they're not filter feeders, all of them. Some of them you know, consume prey, and some of them are filter feeders, like the sand dollar. They have radial symmetry. So a sand dollar is an animal. So when they are alive, you may see them at like the shell store, or you might see them washed up on the beach. Um, they're dead. It's what's remaining is sort of their skeleton. Um, just like you can find a starfish once it's dead, like the skeleton doesn't break down, it's dead, but you can pick it up. And um, here's a uh, little time lapse video. This is a sand dollar actually moving. They do move. They kind of they look, they work sort of like uh, one of those Roomba robotic vacuum cleaners. They sort of go around the surface of the sand, and they they suck up little bits of water and filter out of that water. Food. So they do move. What about the starfish you can fly on? Yeah, I'll show you that one. So this one's not very exciting, but it's just you can see they do move. It's going in a circle. It's going in sort of a spiral. It's an it. It's an it. Alright. Here you have another uh, video. 
So this is again time lapse. They move pretty quickly. Starfish have these little things that are called tube feet on the bottom that help they use to move around. Oh, what the oh, oh my god! god. Oh, 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 That's their mouth. Their body opening is in the central part on the bottom of the starfish. No. Oh, they'll only eat the shell. They'll break it open and consume the inside parts, and then the shell will come out. <laughs> also, the, um, these are sea urchins, are another type of chinoderms. The things that have those spikes on them, those are also kind of. Starfish also have an interesting um, ability to regenerate. Uh, if an arm of the starfish was cut off, it will regrow. In fact, if you um, cut off the starfish in half, each half will grow a whole new starfish, and you'll end up with two starfish. Is that like a version of the starfish? Yeah, that's like... Wouldn't it have to be water? Yeah, it would have to be water. Do they do that to themselves? No, they don't, but they, they kind of... Uh, if that happens so, to them. They don't just split in half, so they don't but die. if they're damaged, no, they die. Are they one of the neural Yeah, they have, they have like a neural net, like a, uh, they have a uh, sort of ring-like so neural system, but no, no brain. None of the things we've talked about so far have um, a brain, per se, like a, a well-developed nervous system. Aren't some? some. All right, worms do have a brain, so some worms have a brain. So worms actually constitute three different phyla. We're lumping them all together here. There's flatworms, platyhelminthes, there's roundworms, nematoda, and there are segmented worms, annelida. Um, so, but we're kind of lumping them together. Some of these worms are parasitic. <coughs> a parasitic organism that feeds on or off of another organism. Oh. So here's um, a worm we're familiar with. What is it? Grover. That's an earthworm. It's called a segmented worm. If you imagine, if you look close to an earthworm, its body has like those sections. Okay, that's a segmented worm. I thought it was just because it's easier to And, um, Earthworms are really important for the soil ecosystem. Earthworms burrow through the soil and consume the soil. It goes through their digestive system where they absorb nutrients, and then their waste um, is used, it sort of fertilizes the soil. They also, those tunnels they burrow through provide um, oxygen into the ground that the roots of plants can use and so forth. They leave <coughs> behind their waste You've, I'm sure you've seen before, but you probably didn't know what it is. You may have picked it up off the ground and like squished it between your fingers or thrown it in your front. Little sort of clusters of it looks like mud. You know what I'm talking about? It might be next to the hole in the yeah. ground. Yeah. That's actually earthworm. They're called castings. Earthworm poop, basically. Yeah. Yes. I do it. Related to an earthworm. Yeah, it just crumbles up. Related to an earthworm, another segmented worm is a leech. So, leeches are parasitic segmented worms, and they um, they can they live off of the blood. They feed on the blood of another organism. Mostly, they feed off of amphibians. Um, and things like that. No, not really. They attach to an organism, their prey. Um, they have two, this is the back sucker. This is not how they feed. This just holds it on. This is the front of the leech, actually. That's its mouth, yep, the pointy end. And basically they find an area, they bite. Their um, saliva has, um, a special chemical which prevents the blood from clotting. And so they bite their prey. They fill up their digestive system with the blood. With blood, they can sort of expand more than twice their size. Once they're filled up with blood, they release and they sort of float to the bottom of the water and sit there and just digest that blood. They don't stay on for very long, just enough to fill up with blood. Um, so 
Not really. They don't really affect people. I mean, they will attach to a person. If you're walking through a pond or swimming in a pond, there's leeches. They may happen to like attach to you, um, but you would just. It's not really dangerous. You would just pull it off if you once you felt it. Um, they're not going to stay on for very long. We're going to talk about leeches being used in medicine as well sometime this week. Is that? How much blood? Uh, I'm not a lot. Not anything that would be dangerous because they're pretty small. They fill up with blood and then they fall off, so they don't stay in there. We yeah. need a lot of, I saw a short movie where you kind of walk down the pond and you were covered yeah. in leeches. Yeah. You ever saw the movie, old movie Stand By Me? Uh, it was based on a Stephen King movie, or Stephen King book. But these kids, um, they go to the swimming pond, they come out, they're all covered in leeches and they flip out. But it's really nothing very dangerous. We'll look at this. Um, this is a flatworm, platyum and thieves. This is um, planaria. They also have the ability to regenerate. If you cut them in half, they'll grow into two new parts. So this is the heart from a dog. And what you see, all this stuff filling up the heart is a parasitic worm. That's heartworm. So if you know if you have a pet at home, a dog, and you give them those little, um, they look like brown and almost looks like a piece of meat. It's called heart guard usually. That's a medicine you give your dog to prevent them from being infected by this parasitic worm. This parasitic worm, it, it can get into them, um, you know, in their, in, um, from the soil, from them being around. They, they ingest this worm and get into their body. This worm lives in their circulatory system. So this parasitic worm makes their way into a dog's um, circulatory system makes its way to the heart, grows, lives off their blood, reproduces, and eventually can become so large that it clogs up their heart and they can't survive. So this is a dog that died from this heartworm. Um, there are lots of worms that are parasites, some of them which affect humans. A tapeworm is a parasitic worm that can affect humans. There's um, a scarus, pork roundworm, which can live in pigs, can get into a human, and it makes its way into a person's brain, lays the eggs in the brain, and that can eventually form cysts, which kill a person. Um, there are diseases. This is a person's foot. What? Oh, no! <laughs> it lo I thought it was a yes. If he didn't tell you that it was a foot, you wouldn't have looked Right. So this is a person that's affected by a worm that's called, that causes a disease called elephantiasis. Elephantiasis is when this worm gets into a person's lymphatic system, clogs it up so that fluids from their body cannot be redistributed. And oh, the fluids cool. in their body start to pool in their lower extremities, causing extreme swelling. This is, it. This is not even really an extreme case. There can be much worse cases. You can see this person's toes, you know, right down here, their foot and ankles all swollen, their calf is all swollen because this worm is clogging up their oh, lymphatic system. Okay. Okay, this is a fluke. <laughs> this, is, this is also yeah. a type of flatworm, but it's a free-living, non-parasitic flatworm. They live in the oceans. They have often very bright colors. They swim through the water. Um, and here you have an example. This is um, a guinea worm. Is another oh. parasitic worm. Sometimes these worms can um, can live in the water, they affect on people. Across wide areas in Africa 
That's the goal of the deal with this on the cargo center level, working with the coalition of governments and international agencies. And obviously, when you don't have anyone, uh, they will kill you. So if you filter out that water, you can remove those gamers. Um, just another um, story. When we got, so Paris and Aquarius can affect lots of different species. And so when we first got our dog, um, we got her very young. So you may have heard that when you get a new dog, it has to be deworm. And what that means is mo almost all dogs are infected with parasitic worms early on during their growth, okay, after they're born. And usually, if you get a dog, you adopt a dog, it's been dewormed before you got it. When we got our dog, we got um, her early, and she hadn't been dewormed yet. So we had to give her the deworming medication. And so she was small, she was only a little um, chihuahua carnitaria mix like this day. We gave her the medication. Um, within the next 48 hours, every single time she went to the bathroom, it looked like a plate of spaghetti on the ground. There were worms longer than her whole body that came out after she gave her the deworming medication. And lots of times these parasitic worms reproduce and spread from animal to animal because when the dog goes to the bathroom, a little bit of the worm comes out, or a segment of the worm. And so if another dog, you know, from the neighborhood is sniffing around where your dog went to the bathroom and your dog had a parasite, and the dog is sniffing around or eating the excrement of your dog, because that's what dogs do sometimes, they could ingest the worm, and then they can become infected with it. Is that one thing? Does it grow inside you? Yes, it grows inside and it's bigger Even and bigger. when they're pulling it out? Um, no, they, after they pull it out, it's gone. The tapeworms usually live in the digestive tract, and they stay attached there. And as the person eats, they, they live off the food that their prey was eating. 